everyone for attending tonight. And, uh, you know, as always, it's just a real pleasure to be with you and spend some time with you and get some creative juices going. And I would like to, um, to introduce our uh, speaker for tonight, who is Jean Dominique, a steadfast supporter of EPCO, a remarkable photographer, and uh, he's participating in this new um, outdoor show. Uh, and um, I got to see some of the work he's going to present tonight, and it just it's, it's so exciting. Uh, I just, just couldn't wait to, to hear from Gene and, and hear about the work uh, in his own words. So I'm just really thrilled uh, about tonight's presentation. And uh, I will turn it over to you, Gene, and you can uh, show us what you got. Cool. Good evening, everybody. This is, um, this is exciting. Um, just a, one housekeeping thing. Um, if for whatever reason I lose my connection, I promise you I will come right back because uh, I may not have paid for the appropriate am amount of um, electrons. And so, you know, I may, may disappear for a brief moment, but um, I'm gonna jump right into it with some, my screen sharing and um, continue to talk about what I'm doing. Uh, so I started this project, it's called um, African American Farmers in the 21st Century. Um, still here, African-American farmers in the 21st century. My grandfather uh, was a sugarcane farmer. And whenever I would visit him um, over the years, um, I would always ask him about his farming and he would always ask me about my, my sort of professional career. And um, when I asked him about the farm, he'd say, yeah, I'm still here, I'm still doing this stuff. And my response, um, with regard to my corporate work was pretty much the same thing. You know, I'm still here doing what I'm doing. Um, and I hadn't thought much about farming for a long time until 2018. Um, and I, a couple of things, I heard a podcast about a farmer called Eddie Wise. Um, Eddie was a Vietnam vet and a blueberry farmer. And all the story was about was his interaction with the USDA and um, how um, a bunch of delays in farm loans and a bunch of other um, kind of underhanded practices um, caused Eddie Wise to lose his farm. And that made me think more about my grandfather um, and how uh, my grandfather was actually successful. He farmed until he was physically unable to do it. And then he was able to pass um, the land on to his four daughters. Um, of course, a debt generation farming wasn't something four women would uh, would undertake, but um, the land has stayed in the family um, ever since my grandfather and his brothers acquired it. And so I just got to thinking about the need for um, to show uh, what black farmers are up to in, in this current environment right now. Um, and so I started to look for um, ways to meet them. Uh, and that started to happen. And in uh, the fall of 2018, I started to travel around the country um, photographing farms, uh, big ones, small ones, and what have you. This map shows you um, where I've been so far up to um, Soul Fire Farms in uh, northern New York State and all the way down to Gidry Farm in a little town called Erath, Louisiana. Um, it's in Cajun country and sugarcane uh, farming country in those southern uh, southern parishes down there. I'm only going to show two um, farms tonight, just in the interest of time. One will be uh, Gidry Farms, and the other one will be uh, Fresh Meadows Farm in Carver, Massachusetts, in uh, the Cape Cod area. Um, they do um, cranberry farming there. Um, and so let's kind of launch into it. This is, uh, oops, sorry. This is Charles Guidry. Uh, he's mid seventies. And this is as much as he will ever smile for you right here. Um, he's uh, all about business. He's a very serious guy uh, about his farm and about uh, what he's up to. Um, he gave me uh, 10 days, essentially, um, five days in April of 2019 and uh, five more days during the harvest season. 
in uh, October I spent with him. Um, this is a, just a picture from the Library of Congress that contrasts um, what you'll see farming looks like today when they bring sugarcane in. Um, this is a historical picture where it was all done by hand um, from the planting to the chopping to the getting it to the mills, you know, um, was, was just business that uh, was pretty much all hand labor um, and not much of that anymore. This is what uh, the sugar cane looked like the first time I went in April, uh, about 12 to 18 inches high. And um, Mr. Gidry has 4,000 acres. And just to give you a perspective of what that means, uh, the average sugarcane farm in Louisiana is about a thousand acres. And over the years, he's um, acquired property um, farmland in three parishes. Parishes are the equivalent of counties in Louisiana. And his farmland is spread out over three um, parishes. And um, the last time I was with him, he had uh, 40, 4,100 acres. And so it's a, it's a big, big commercial operation. Uh, it's, the operation is run uh, primarily by Mr. Guidry and um, a few, few of his relatives, a couple of relatives, um, and a small cadre of, of Mexican and Guatemalan um, immigrant uh, farmers that come over on visas for about six months out of the year and work with him on his farm. This particular uh, picture is um, his brother-in-law. Um, who's one of his uh, truck drivers. And this guy is going to pick up a load of fertilizer. Uh, this is what the, um, the fertilizing operation looks like. He gets one of these big um, semi truck uh, and trailers full of fertilizer back here. Uh, and then he'll take that back to the farm. Um, so this is that big truck you just saw um, eventually they'll empty all this fertilizer into this um, tractor, which is, you see the, the tracks here and the tires enable this one to go into the fields. And so they can fill these containers up um, while this stuff is going on. So they don't have to continually go back to this big um, vehicle that can't get into the actual fields. So the fertilizer goes from here to this smaller one and to this um, tractor here where it's spread out over the crops. Uh, these are um, some of the farm hands. This guy is uh, Brian Guidry, um, Mr. Guidry's nephew, who's uh, really in line to take over the farm um, when Mr. Guidry finally stops. Um, one of the dilemmas with, uh, with farming and in particular African-American farming is it's the dilemma of what happens next. Um, you know, these folks spent many, many years um, working hard trying to um, build farms and make enough money to get their kids, you know, out of the country, off the farms, into um, colleges and universities where they could get, quote, good jobs so they wouldn't have to farm. And to the extent that's been successful, the kids are now um, not wanting to come back. And uh, when, when these guys, and they're primarily all, all men, um, I've only been to one farm so far that's run by a woman, but um, when the kids do leave, they start professional careers after college and um, they don't want to come back to the farms. And so when these guys get into their 70s and 80s, uh, it's a dilemma about what, what happens to the farm. Um, in this case, Brian's been doing this stuff since high school, and he says he's pretty convinced um, that that's all he really wants to do. So um, we'll see how that turns out down the road. Um, I try to mix up these images with some detail shots like this in addition to um, some where I back off and give you an idea of what's going on in the farming operation. Um, these guys typically work from before sunup until well after sundown. All of this equipment has floodlights and, um, allow, and, and air conditioning in the tractors and all the modern conveniences so they can work um, many, many hours a day. Uh, this whole notion of an eight to five or nine to five is not something that's um, adhered to on the farm. They, they pretty much do what they need to do on a particular day until 
um, they get it done and then they just start the next morning. So this is what it looks like when the um, fertilizer is being spread over um, some of the, um, the sugarcane when it's, uh, this is about in April um, when the stuff is just starting to come up. Uh, what I wanted to show here is the um, level of um, technology, I guess, and me mechanization. You see that screen to the left. Um, it has GPS settings and coordinates. And this is how they can get, you know, acres and acres of rows that are just straight up and down. Um, they always know where they are in, in relation to um, the rest of the, the tractors. And um, they can lay out how they want the, the rows to work out and all that kind of stuff. It, uh, it, it's all done. Um, Mr. Gidry has a, a, a farms out the, uh, no pun intended, but he farms out the, the programming of all this stuff based on the acreage that he wants to, um, to, to harvest and um, they send him back uh, the details that he needs to run the tractors. One thing about Mr. Gidry, and this is one thing I learned about the farmers uh, in general, uh, well, a couple of things. Number one, um, they are, they are, these are not gentlemen farmers, you know, they're not sitting on the porch watching people do work. These people are uh, actively involved. Mr. Gidry is the guy with the, with the cowboy hat. And there's nothing uh, about this farm, nothing about this operation that Gidry can't do. Um, and, and he can do it as well as, you know, the 22, 23, 24 year old guys working on the farm. Um, after I, the first time I spent, what I typically do my my practice is to spend five days with uh, with a particular farmer. So I fly in on a Sunday, um, start you know get to know people on Sunday and Monday, and then um, shoot until Friday or Saturday when I leave. Um, and Mr. Gidry was getting me up at four o'clock in the morning, and on Wednesday I said to myself after I got up, you know, I th I think I'm going to call Gidry and tell him I'm not coming today because I just need a break. You know, I just need to to regroup and clean the gear and, and just, I'll catch up with him on Thursday. And I thought about that for like 30 minutes. And I said, you know, you, you need to get up and get, get to work and get with these guys. It would just be um, unconscionable to do this. And, and they're out there working and all you're doing is running around taking pictures of them. Um, and it just wouldn't, wouldn't look, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't go over too well. So I got out on my Wednesday and, and stuck with it. But uh, these, these they, they just work extraordinarily hard. Um, here, Gidry and his um, head mechanic, um, they're working on clearing some of these um, hoses and lines for the fertilizer. And here, this piece of equipment broke down um, just out in the, in the middle of the field. And um, this was to my earlier point, when something needs to be repaired, they, they get it done. You know, they don't, they don't call mechanics and they don't call repair people to come into the farm. Um, they have uh, all the equipment and everything they need to get and all the expertise to get most of this stuff done. And um, here they're just trying to, I think, get an axle together. It had gotten bent or something like that. And this is Gidry doing what he does a lot. He's, he's always in these guys' ear. He's always telling them what he needs done and, and how he needs it done. A few frames after this, he was going to jump in the tractor and show them what to do because he didn't feel like they were doing it correctly. Um, Hands-on is, is what this guy is all about. Uh, so they go from, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning until whenever they finish in the evening. Um, one of the things, one of the last things they do every day um, is clean off all of the equipment before they go back out into the fields um, in the, the next day. Um, and so this is what's going on here. This stuff, after it's all cleaned up, they'll, they'll put it away for the evening. Um, and then um, before the drivers and the field hands come in, um, the mechanic, his, his mechanic will check everything out to make sure they're ready to go for the next day. Uh, and this is the uh, sugarcane uh, processing uh, plant. Um, there's three of these in, in, in Mr. Gidry's area. Um, they are all run on a collective basis. Um, and he takes crops, depending upon which um, parish 
he's working in, um, he will take uh, um, the harvest to the closest uh, mill um, based on where, where that particular farm is. And those two big stacks are um, part of that, um, uh, the, the convection um, ovens where they boil down the, the sugar cane and get it from um, liquid into um, granular form. Uh, this is now uh, into October. So before the sugar cane was 12 to 18 inches high and now it's 10, 12 feet um, tall. Um, and there's two things going on. This is a harvester um, that cuts it at once. It cuts off the tops of the uh, sugar cane, um, trims the bottom off and cuts the midsection into about 18 inch to 24 inch um, pieces. The sugar cane is then dumped into this um, uh, device, this tractor uh, trailer, and then it'll be taken out into big trucks and hauled uh, to one of the mills uh, that I was talking about. What they, and they try to, uh, Mr. Guidry, based on his 4,000 acres or 4,100 acres, um, will try to get um, close to 100,000 tons of sugarcane out during a harvest season, which goes from basically October to maybe uh, December or January. And they try to do um, 90 to 100 tons um, deliveries per day. So that's, that's pretty intense stuff that they're doing here. Um, early in the morning, he's going to be one of the first ones out there um, making sure, you know, things are going to start off right and telling people where they need to be, which field they need to be in. Uh, this truck was loaded the previous night, um, the trailer. And so the first thing they'll be doing is delivering this load um, to the mill. This uh, harvester is an old one, and when I saw this, this was sort of instrumental in um, making me realize I needed to come back because the first time I was, uh, Gidry invited me out and I didn't want to say no, but he invited me out um, in April when things were, um, you know, the, the crop was just not ready for harvest, very, very small and um, sort of fresh stalks coming out of the ground. But I saw this device and it's, you know, a little over two stories tall. And I said, like a city guy, Mr. Gary, what is that? And he said, oh, that's just, that's one of my old harvesters and we're going to get rid of it because um, I got a couple of new ones. And uh, so here he's uh, talking to um, a farmer from Korea and a mechanic off to the right. And uh, that's a, um, a, an agent in the middle who's kind of um, trying to put this deal together to get this harvester sold. Uh, but when I saw this thing, I realized I needed to come back during the harvest season to see this kind of equipment and, uh, and photograph this stuff in action. Uh, and it's just extraordinary to see when, um, when I went back, I was not uh, disappointed. So, you know, four o'clock in the morning, the guys are there, they're there, but they're, they're not exactly wide awake yet. And these are trucks were all loaded the night before. Um, they want to be at the mill as early as they can because the idea is to get all that tonnage um, done um, on a particular day. So they'll they'll run these things just over and over and over from the field to the uh, to the mill. Uh, and so these are ready to go. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Gidry again, and uh, one of the tractors had a problem with a fender, and uh, he wasn't satisfied with the repairs that people were doing, so he just jumped right in there himself. And this is what it looks like. This thing is uh, about two and a half stories tall, and it just looks like, you know, a, 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 some sort of um, a monster, and it sounds like that, and it just, it functions. Um, it's just heavy equipment. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Also very muddy by the time I got back in October. So this is another angle um, of the, you can see these, um, I'm not even sure what they're called, but these things are sort of taking all that sugar cane um, and the tops are being ripped off and the bottoms being cut and then it's being ground up to smaller pieces into this tractor um, to be taken to the big uh, trailers to go to the mill. That's what it looks like from behind. 
and this is what uh, the sugar cane looks like after it's been cut up. Um, when I was a kid and my grandfather was doing this stuff, we would always see the the sugar cane um, once it was harvested and it would be, you know, six, seven feet tall. But these days they cut it up into these little, um, just these little, they call them sticks and they're little 18 inch to a couple of feet long sticks. And this is what I was talking about before. This trailer, this is where the, the um, crop goes. And uh, these things, they just go from out of the field, they dump into this big truck, this big truck goes to the mill, and then they rinse and repeat. Um, you know, I, I could have cleaned this up. I left this image in to talk about, um, this is really dirty work for them and it was dirty work for me. Um, what I'd have to do is clean off my lenses every night after I finish this stuff, because if I didn't, the images would look like this. There's all kind of schmutz and dirt and dust um, by the end of the day. Uh, I was a, a mess after finishing uh, each day here. Yeah, this is what it looked like in October when after after a big rain, it's just um, tough work. And there's Mr. Gidry. He's doing um, one thing he couldn't do was some particular uh, work on this tire. So he wanted to, he wanted me to go with him because he wanted to introduce me to the people that were going to make this repair. But I just really love this is this is sort of um, him at his best. You know, he's he's talking to me and he's talking to somebody that you can't see off to the right to the left there. Um, but he he he's always sort of in control and in charge. Um, and this picture kind of demonstrates that, I think. And this is another um, angle of the uh, sugar cane being dumped into that big trailer. Uh, and uh, the drive, that's the driver there. He always wants to make sure that this thing is going to be completely full before they take it out of the field. Um, otherwise, they're, you know, not being as efficient as they can. And way off in the background, you can see another one being filled. So it's just um, it's just a continuous activity. And once they're done with a particular field, this is what it looks like. So, um, and this is this is one example. Gidry has four of these op these operations running in different different uh, parishes. Um, but this is a repair truck. It's got a bunch of tools and stuff on it. And there's one guy in charge here. This big trailer is the um, the, the trailer that takes um, the sugar cane to the to the mill. This is the big harvester, and this is another one. And then this is the smaller truck that will fill this one up. And so. This is sort of a complete um, fleet of, uh, of harvesting equipment. This is what it looked like when the sun was going down. Um, and I was wanting to go back to my hotel room, but it wasn't going to happen. So different picture later on in the evening, sun still going down. And uh, at, I don't know, eight, nine o'clock now, they're finally starting to wrap up for the day. Um, you can see the harvester with those floodlights I was talking about. So they really can run this thing as long as they want. Um, and uh, the roads around uh, this part of Louisiana look just like this when, when harvest is going on. The truck I'm in um, that I'm photographing from is heading in one direction to a, a mill in a place called St. Martinville. And there's other farmers going in the other direction to a mill that's in another parish. Um, and it's just uh, all day long, they're delivering stuff to the mills. This is an, another shot of the, um, the mill in St. Martinville. So the, this is just, was amazing to me the first time I saw it. So the, this is the answer to how do you get all the sugar cane out of that tractor, out of the trailer? The answer is you lift it up, you know, more than 45 degrees and let gravity dump it all out. Um, I was, I was uh, just naive. So we get here and the driver backs this tractor and trailer up into this device. And, um, and I'm just sitting there, like just taking it all in. And he said, well, we have to get out now because they're going to, they're going to lift the truck, the, the, the truck up. And I'm like, 
they're going to lift it up. And he's like, yeah, you, we can't sit in here. You know, it's a safety violation. We got to get out of here. So this is the driver. And I'm at the other side of the, this, this area. But uh, this is just amazing. I mean, even when I look at it now, it blows me away that uh, somebody figured out this was the fastest way to get the stuff out of there. You know, we've, we've been here before, so sorry about the duplications. I thought I'd gotten these out. They let me, uh, in April when I was there, they let me go inside the mill to do some um, photography. But in October, when things are going full tilt, um, um, I wasn't allowed. So this is a bit of what it looks like. The um, sugar cane um, goes into here uh, in liquid form and then um, boiled and boiled and boiled until it finally um, turns into the granular stuff that we're used to seeing. Uh, and I have a, a, sh a shot coming up where you'll see um, the final product. So another, um, another shot of the inside of the mill. I, I had a good time. They let me hang around here just as long as I wanted to in making these kind of, you know, um, uh, architectural um, images was just really enjoyable. This is Mr. Gidry standing on at the bottom of a mountain of sugarcane. Um, this is what it looks like. Is this is one of many, many of his warehouses where the, the stuff is stored after it's processed. Um, and then from here, it goes to a different, <coughs> a different processing uh, facility. This is kind of raw sugar, and um, there's one more step in the process that gets it. Um, to the pure white stage that, that we're familiar with. And uh, so I spent, what, 10 days, 11 days with this guy. And the day that I was going to leave, um, he, he, like most of the farmers I've met, they're all, you know, kind of stoic and they play all this stuff very close to the vest. And are you making a profit? Nah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. They don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. But there was this uh, warehouse off in the distance, and nobody was ever going over there. There wasn't anything happening. But Mr. Gidry said, you know, there's something I want to show you at this warehouse. And he walked me over there, and he opened it up, and, um, and he showed me this Rolls Royce. <laughs> and this is different than his 1959, you know, Chevy uh, truck that he uses every day. And I said, Mr. Gidry, what, what is this? And he goes, well, you know, 20, uh, 2017 was a pretty good year for us here. And, and my wife thought she needed a new car. So I had to take her to Dallas. And this is what I got her. And, and so I, I went and talked to his wife later. And I said, Ms. Gidry, I, I've never been in one of these cars. Will you take me for a ride? And she said, that's not my car. That's his car. That's, he likes to tell that story. It's not my car. So um, this is sort of the, the fruit of this guy's labor. He's very, very proud of this car. He wouldn't let me leave. Um, and again, you can see, uh, I kept trying to get the guy to smile, but that, that wasn't going to happen. So, but still, he's, he's very proud of this car. Uh, that's the first farm. Can we, um, I'll stop okay. sharing and maybe we can talk about this stuff for a bit before. Yeah, I go that'd, that'd be fantastic, Gene. Um, and uh, folks, if you have questions, go ahead and and throw it in the chat, but uh, also feel free to speak up uh, if anyone wants to jump in with a question or a comment for Gene. But me personally, I feel like I've been on this amazing journey. And uh, what my uh, question, Gene, to start with is, it seems like a lot of your images are uh, about these uh, um, these powerful machines, you know, everything's on such an, a big scale and you're showing them in motion or you're showing them in these positions, you know, where they're, you know, where they're like these large mechanical devices. And um, what, how did that, you talked a little bit about how it struck you when you were there being around these big machines. Uh, and also Gidry himself is a figure of, of power you know, that he has a stature among the, his workers and. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a real, you know, sort of pillar of the community, but um, the, the uh, I guess the important thing about the, about farming in, in the 21st century is, 
in order to try to make a profit, it has to be mechanized. Um, uh, you know, there was a time when, when this was all done, like I said earlier, by hand, but you can't, you can't make it, you couldn't survive without um, John Deere and all this related heavy equipment. So it's all that stuff is really integral to the, to the farm process um, these days. Real quick Gina, question. This is Richard. When you, when you were there uh, shooting that, I was in India and I was shooting sugarcane farmers and they, uh, still, yeah. they still do the whole thing by hand. So it was such, so great to see this view versus that view and they still keep it in long six foot stalks. And, yeah, yeah. I looked at a bunch of um, Library of Congress images um, about how it used to be done. And uh, it, it bears little resemblance to, 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 to the way it used to be done. So, I, I also want to say I loved that portrait of the harvester where you really had it spread across the landscape and you got the full breadth of that machine. Yeah, it's, a, it's, an, amazing, it's an amazing piece of equipment. It really, um, and, uh, you know, he was, he was very kind of circumspect about issues related to costs and expenses and all that, but he did let on that the, the harvester he was selling to the Koreans was going to net him sort of low six figures, but that was going to help pay for the new one and that, you know, um, several hundred thousand dollars in each of these pieces of equipment. Um, one, one load of that fertilizer that I showed you um, runs sixty to seventy thousand uh, dollars every time they have to fill up that truck. Wow, um, that tanker. So um, it's it's serious stuff in terms of the economics of it. Really, really quickly, do, how, do you know if they fared well with the previous hurricane? You know, I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't talked to him in a while, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that uh, this part of Louisiana wasn't uh, directly in the in the um, path of the hurricane, but you know, I'm sure they got a lot of rain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I haven't, one, I haven't talked to him recently. That one mud picture just kind of yeah. showed it up. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 tough stuff out there. But you know, it's just another day at their office. They don't, they don't. Uh, oh, I got to tell you before I forget. Um, we were talking about holidays and and all that kind of stuff. And so th what they do because Christmas can fall during the harvest season, and so in order to let um, the workers celebrate Christmas, they work from midnight uh, on Christmas Eve until noon on Christmas Day everybody gets off the rest of the day so they can, you know, do whatever they want. The, none of these um, temp workers have families here. So what they're doing on Christmas day is trying to find ways to make calls and send money back home. But um, after, uh, after Christmas dinner in the evening, they go right back to work. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so they don't, you know, it's not a whole lot of uh, fun and games even on Christmas day. I was going to say something about, um, it's well, I don't know if it's ironic or not, but the the sort of whole basis of Louisiana as a both as a colony and under the auspices of a lot of places was the sugarcane harvest. And it's yeah. interesting that it's sort of come to here. This also reminds me, I was in the Palouse in uh, Washington State, Eastern mm -hmm. Washington, mm -hmm. and uh, for, was doing a workshop. And we were photographing some farms, and it's the same thing. This farmer, because they, they grow a lot of wheat that they used to sell all over the place. So this farmer says, come here, I want to show you something. And he opens up this kind of old dilapidated barn that had an Olympic-sized swimming pool inside. <laughs> which sort of reminds me of your Rolls Royce story. So there's all kinds of stories and all kinds of maybe things we don't hear about in terms of our, uh, agriculture on both ends of the kind of economic spectrum. Yeah, 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 it's true, it's true. Let me grab a few questions out of the chat here. So Janie Sampson says, regarding the harvester, do you know what those two screwy things are? Screw thingies. Uh, yeah, I don't know what they're called, but the, the, the goal is to, as a device goes through uh, the fields, those um, things twist and they, they bring the uh, sugar cane into the device where they get all chopped up and cut out and the debris is spit one way back into the field and the sugar cane is spit into the uh, the trailer. So I, I don't know the name of them, but um, I'm sure Google can help you figure it out. 
Uh, Ron asks. Acute screw thingies is actually the technical term. There ah, there you go. Yeah. I looked it up. <laughs> uh, Ron asks, uh, is the nephew learning to make all the repairs? Um, it, is the nephew what? Learning to make all the repairs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's he's just as good as as, as his uncle, um, and very dedicated. There are. Um, he's got I don't know three or four other relatives that work a little bit and don't work sometimes and are not very reliable. Um, but Brian Brian is uh, he's dedicated to this stuff. So um, yeah, he's he's very much into it. Uh, Jenny asks, how did you get around the field all day? And backup question for me, what camera gear did you have with you? Um, I walked. I walked. <laughs> I walked all over. <laughs> I walked and I ran. So those, those pictures where, uh, you know, I'm behind the, uh, the harvester and that, uh, that catch, catch device. Um, I'm literally running behind this thing while it's spewing out all this stuff because I wanted to have, I wanted to have an image of all that stuff being spewed around. So I had to run in the mud behind that, uh, behind them while they were working. Um, but you know, I, I almost hate to say it cause it sounds just like a wimp, but, um, for the five days that I was there in April and the five days in October, um, I kept the same hours, and I thought it was important to keep the same hours that they kept. I didn't want to be the guy that showed up at 11 and left at 3. Yeah. <laughs> so if Mr. Gidry said, you know, um, we're going to, and, he, and he, never, he never said, I need you to do something. He said, we're going to be starting at 4.30 tomorrow morning, um, and, you know, you have the GPS coordinates to the, to the warehouse where we start, so maybe I'll see you there. And he always, he gave me that little bit of an out, maybe I'll see you there, but um, I was there when they started and then whenever they wrapped up at night, I would just go back to my hotel. So I, I you know, um, part of the, I think it's credibility is kind of important. Access is the first piece of it, but then once you're, once I'm there, um, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the city guy to the extent, you know, I can avoid that. I, I just want to, um, uh, legitimately document what they're up to. And if I'm, if I'm doing banker's hours or city guy hours, I don't think that's going to go over too well. So um, I use uh, Canon gear. Um, I take a couple of camera bodies with me and three, um, uh, what, 24 to 105, which is a pretty useful one for that stuff. Um, I think it's 14 to 28 or something, whatever the Canon um, wide angle not the fisheye, I think it's 14 to 28 or something like that. And then the 70 to 200, I just take, cause I always need upper body work. Um, I hardly ever use it in these, um, in these, these, at these shoots, but I always keep it just, I don't even know why. Hmm. So those three lenses is what I take. And then there's an hour or so of uh, gear cleanup every night. Um, just, just out of necessity, you just have to do it. Yeah. I got to say that the, the 5D, um, I, got, I dropped one of the bodies once and it, it cleaned up and it's still functioning fine. So that's not really an issue. Nice. Uh, Sharon asks if uh, Dr. Guidry saw these photographs, what does he think about them? Yeah, he has seen them and he, uh, he grunted his approval, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got, on his, uh, on his farm, he's got one of his, let's see, his father's first tractor. And so I did um, a, a photograph of that tractor and had it framed and sent it to him um, as a way to thank him. But uh, uh, he's pretty supportive of the project. He, you know, he's introduced me to some other farmers and um, whenever this thing is done and he's available, he's committed to, to being a part of, um, if I could ever put together a road show or whatever, he's, He's supportive and he's a good man. Fantastic. Okay, last couple questions uh, from Deanna. Um, how do people initially react when you tell them about your project? Uh, I've only had one farmer turn me down so far. And um, I've talked to, I photographed on seven farms, talked to give or take a dozen. Um, COVID-19, not 2020, you know, just out in terms of, uh, production work, but I've been rejected, uh, a soft rejection. Um, 
um, a man who I won't identify um, said, I'd love to do this, but I have an exclusive deal with the History Channel. They're, they're doing something on me and my farm, so, um, so I, can't, I can't do it for you. And that was about a year ago. So I'm going to come back to him later on down the road because uh, his History Channel thing has, has already aired. And so maybe he'll, he'll, uh, he'll agree to do it. He's a pretty um, prominent sort of farmer activist type. Uh, and I think uh, what I'm trying to do in the project is show uh, the diversity of black farming. So I want old farmers, I want young farmers, I want um, geographic diversity, crop diversity, um, different times of year, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he's one of the activist farmers I'd like to, to spend some time with. So I'm going to go back to him. But no, he's the only person and he turned me down not for a um, uh, any other reason than he was already under contract with someone. So um, for the most part, these, these folks have been surprised and pleased to know that anybody's interested in what they're doing. Really, that's, that's my take on it. Um, the, uh, okay, more questions for you. Do, Gene, do you, do you, uh, you said maybe you were going to show another set a material? Yeah, I have a, we, we'll go to a, sur I mean, a sur uh, cranberry farm for the second. Okay. Uh, well, uh, how about we'll save some questions to the end because, yeah, I can't wait to get to the cranberries. Okay. okay. Fire away. Yep. Oh, I guess I have to share the screen first, don't I? You guys got that? Yeah. Yes. It's a cranberry colored shirt. There we go. Um, when I first started this, I thought the series would be uh, in, in black and white. And as you will see, I haven't had the heart to, um, to do this bit of it in black and white yet. I just haven't had the haven't been able to do it. It's uh, cranberries are just a uh, colorful fruit. And um, I was here in uh, November in Cape Cod and the colors were just beautiful. So um, maybe it'll get to black and white, but it's not yet. This guy's uh, Dom Fernandez and uh, he's a third generation cranberry farmer in a town called Carver, Massachusetts. It's really the um, uh, principal area where cranberries are farmed um, in, in New England, in Massachusetts. And it goes back many, many years. Um, Fernandez and his family have been doing this stuff. Uh, like I said, he's the third generation. And um, they, these uh, are Cape Verdeans. They came from the Cape Verde Islands, not as farmers, but as just laborers um, initially. And um, over time started to learn uh, about cranberry farming and um, so they, they stayed and they've made a go at it here. This is what the farm looks like. Uh, these, this is a cranberry bog. Uh, this is where the um, organic cranberries are processed and sorted and, um, and they're taken over here for packaging. Um, and they just, they use a tractor to transport from here to here. But uh, this, this is a, a refrigerated storage area that the cranberries are kept in. Interesting thing about this cranberry bog this is the oldest one. He's got a uh, little over 30 acres of bogs spread around, um, spread around this town of Carver. But this bog has been successfully producing cranberries for over 100 years, if you can believe it. And this is what they look like. Unlike the uh, ocean spray commercial that we're all familiar with, cranberries are um, kind of a, um, a low growing, uh, creeping vine um, and uh, the, the the ocean spray um, you know guys in the in the water thing uh, is something we'll see and that's that's one way to harvest them but that's not the principal way to harvest them or not the only way to harvest them uh, this is mr. Fernandez uh, and he's right here this is called the dry harvest and this machine um, takes the cranberries off the little vines and it throws them back into these um, bags. There's a, a bag back here that you can't see, but when the, the bag gets full, 
it goes out of the field and into an area where they start to sort them. These are um, organic berries. The organic berries are done uh, in the dry harvest fashion, unlike the commodity berries that are done uh, at the wet harvest, and we'll see that in a minute. So this is what a, what a standard bog looks like. Um, this one, they have these um, ditches that run through here, so if they want to um, uh, flood these bogs, they can flood them, but they're not going to do that with these because they're doing organic berries, and the organic berries um, can't be flooded. They have to be dry harvested. Uh, this is um, his buddy Wayne, and this is the um, owner of the bog. This, this area is leased land. Some of his, he's got 30 or 35 acres of uh, land that he owns, and he's leasing the land, um, trying to perfect his organic um, crop. And that's a sort of a long story, but he's not willing to invest in purchasing the bogs until he knows he's gonna be able to do it um, year, year in and year out. And he hasn't gotten there. He hadn't gotten there when I was with him, so. Um, so manual labor involved in this. Once that, that bag is full, um, this guy will take it out of the field and dump it into um, a container that then will go back to the uh, area where it'll be, the berries will be sorted out. Um, and in this portrait, you can see what I was talking about and my difficulty um, in converting to black and white here. It's just such a beautiful scenery um, and just a, a really interesting time of year for color imagery. This is Lenny, by the way. Um, Mr. Fernandez works with uh, some other guys, I think four other guys uh, or five other guys, and he's known them all since high school. Um, and during um, harvest season, they all come back to work with him. This is his brother, John, and this, they're, they're starting to um, get the cranberries out of the vines here. The vines are just gonna be trashed. And this is a, uh, an image of John on a tractor, and there's a bunch of the organic berries going into refrigerated storage. Um, this is Billy Mulligan. Billy's a 20-year-old guy, uh, interesting character. He, he's by far the youngest person around here, um, but Billy wants to be a farmer when, uh, when he can afford uh, his own farm, so he's learning what he can learn here at uh, Fresh Meadows Farm. Uh, and this is this was interesting because sort of the um, all the heavy lifting, all the heavy duty stuff out in the field was done exclusively by men, and all of this sorting and packing activity um, was done by women. But here they're sorting um, organic berries, and this is very interesting to to spend time and see. Um, they're having they're not uh, laughing because or they're laughing at me, I think, because I was a city guy, but. Um, they have a good time. Um, they, they enjoy each other's company because they're doing this stuff 10 hours a day. And uh, they wanted, they, they told me what they did. They told me how they did it. And then they said, you're not going to believe it, but we can do this stuff with our eyes closed. And they showed me. Uh, and it's about the weight of the berries and the texture and the feel. And they really could sort them um, with their eyes closed. It was pretty interesting to see that. And then they, the, the ones that um, are going to be uh, packaged go down here. And the ones that are thrown away just go back out into the fields as fertilizer. So this is the wet harvest. This is the, uh, the commodity berry. This is the berry that's going to go to ocean spray. Um, the organic berries are being packaged um, under the name Fresh Meadows Farm. And I've seen them in Safeway and whatnot. They, they get distributed nationally. Um, but uh, he's, he's not clear that he can make a go of the organic stuff. Uh, there's a bigger margin in organics, but there's also a lot, of, uh, a lot of variables that he's still trying to sort out. So this is the real um, serious part of his operation, this commodity berry that goes um, to, uh, to ocean spray. And what happens here is they, that uh, dry, um, bog that you saw earlier, they'll, they'll put about three feet of water in it and then the berries will float. And then this device will go through and shake the berries out um, of the vines and then they'll float. Um, and then what you'll see, this is what they look like after they're floating 
these are just some along um, uh, the, the uh, edge of the bog. And this thrasher is then kicking the berries uh, free from the vines. And you can see a little bit of the vines here. Um, he uses these things to mark his location because there are ditches here that he doesn't want to run into. I'm, I'm sorry, Gene, can you go back to that previous? Image? Yeah. It looks like you're standing in the water here. Yeah, underwater housing for the uh, cannon works marvelously. Yeah, I rented the underwater housing from Borrow Lenses for, um, for five days because I wanted to be able to make these kind of pictures. I didn't want to be standing um, on the sideline at the edge of the bog and not being able to safely uh, go into the water. <coughs> they gave me waders and they laughed at me when I put them on and because I couldn't figure out how to do it. But um, I, you know, I wasn't worried about my own, I wasn't worried about getting wet. I was worried about dropping a camera. And so the underwater housing was pretty valuable for that. Yeah, you got the shot. Yeah, exactly. And so these um, buoys are the same kind of buoys that are used to encapsulate oil spills. And they unwind it from here. And this guy, John, is going to start to take it around this bog. Um, and this is, once they get the berries um, all buoyed in and they get them closer and closer and closer to this device, this device then sucks them out of the, out of the bog. And this is what it looks like when they're corralling them. He's eventually gonna go all the way around, all the way around, all the way around back to here um, and make a very tight kind of oval with the berries in them. And that's what it looks like after they're corral. And they have to physically move them because the, they, they get very heavy. You know, this is like three, four, could be five inches deep worth of uh, berries. And so they have to, in order to keep tightening the buoy, they have to physically move them away from the edge and into the middle. And again, you can see this beautiful fall, um, the season when I was there, it was just gorgeous. This is what it looks like when that is, they're finally corralled and they're starting to um, suck the berries out of the bog into this device here. And I'll, I'll show you on, in a minute how this works, but um, this is a washer and um, Wayne is up here washing the berries and they're getting dumped into this truck. So this is Billy and he's just kind of helping things along. So they go, um, this hose here and this uh, device sucks the berries out of the bog. They get pushed up to this washer here, cleaned and dumped into the truck. And then the excess water and debris gets thrown into this truck here. The water, as you can see, the excess water comes out here and then drains back into the bog. So this, this sort of is a complete uh, circular um, harvesting operation. This device is purpose built. Um, uh, Mr. Fernandez said he had seen something like this, but it wasn't exactly what he wanted. So he sketched some stuff out and he had somebody build this for them. This is a, a close up of uh, the berries getting washed and dumped into the truck. That's a different angle of that. And this truck is almost full. Um, and Wayne's the driver. He's going to take it uh, to uh, Ocean Spray. And he's off. I had a good time talking to this guy. I spent uh, an afternoon with him going back and forth out of the fields to uh, Ocean Spray. And uh, interesting guy, you know, he's. Um, grown up in this area and he, he, he does a lot of um, construction work in the off season and whatnot. But he said that uh, Dom is a, is a very fair and, and good guy to work for. So he comes back every year. He's been doing it for 20 some years. Um, comes back during the harvest season to work. And again, 
the second time I saw this, I wasn't surprised, but this continues to be the quickest way to get stuff out, right? So now we're at the um, ocean spray manufacturing um, facility and they just, they dump a load of berries out. Um, they get weighed and tested. <coughs> um, and and just, this is it. Uh, nobody would let me, this was more, um, there's more security here. They wouldn't let me inside the factory at all. But this guy will take a few uh, cups of this, this device here. He'll stick it in here um, and do some testing. And based on, based on two or three cups of this, these berries, he'll decide whether the uh, ocean spray is going to accept this entire load or reject it based on sugar content and, and um, other factors that uh, they think is important. And these are the guys, um, Billy, Lenny, John, Wayne, and Mr. Fernandez. All right. Wow, yeah, that was another, another journey. I think I'm ready for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was it. Uh, the Cranberry Farm is the last farm I was on. Um, I had some things planned for um, early 2020, but uh, you know, that was in the before times. So um, at some point I'll regroup and, and try to get back out there. All right, I'm just looking through questions. Uh, As someone from New Jersey who has a lot, there's a lot of cranberry bogs in Jersey down south. Uh, it, was, it was really cool to see that because normally you just drive by them and not stop <laughs> or just, stop and get a, a, a bag, but it's it was really cool. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I see that. Uh, did I get some cranberries? So here's the thing about farmers, to a, to a person and to a farm, none of them will let you leave without taking whatever it is they have, right? So the answer is, yeah, I got to take some cranberries home. Yeah, I got to take uh, some uh, um, sticks of sugar cane home and you know all the other stuff that, that I've, uh, all the other farms I've been to, uh, people, um, they're just generous that way. That's just part of what they want to do. And I, I, before I forget, I want to tell you guys about the one that got away. And this was that kind of rookie, um, are you really a documentarian kind of uh, mistake I made? So one of the, uh, I said earlier, I want to show like crop diversity. And so I had been telling um, everybody I wanted to photograph on a cannabis farm because it's legal and all that kind of stuff. But it's, you know, it's unusual. It's not something you necessarily think about when you think about farming. So um, I was successfully introduced to a young guy who's got a cannabis farm down in Salinas. And so I didn't have to fly across country. I, you know, I could drive to see him. And so I made arrangements to go down. Um, I drove down there one day and uh, he showed me around the farm. He's got a couple of hundred thousand uh, cannabis plants, and they can go from, you know, little tiny plants to harvesting something like every 12 weeks or 14 weeks or something like that, because it's all, uh, they force these things to, um, to flower. But um, I didn't take a camera, you know, I wanted to just talk to the guy and learn the farm and see my way around and all this kind of stuff. And that all went well. And he said, oh, you know, you can come back, blah, blah, blah. And then I have never been able to put my hands on this kid again because he's really successful at what he's doing and he's single and he's young and all that that implies. And so my mistake was not making the photographs when I had the opportunity to go down to, uh, to the cannabis farm. So if anybody knows cannabis farmers, um, black cannabis farmers, um, tell me about it, but uh, that's a missed opportunity. So I'm, and, and I, as I reached out to him four or five times. And <laughs> one time I sent him a text and I said, hey, all next week I'm free. I can come down, I can spend the week in, uh, in Salinas. And he texted back, well, I'm in Bora Bora right now. When I, <laughs> when I come back, <laughs> I'll reach out to you. So um, yeah, anyway, that's the one that got away so far. Fantastic. I bet um, the sugar cane farmers and the cranberry farmers don't go to Bora Bora too often. <laughs> Absolutely not. 
<laughs> Absolutely not. In fact, um, Mr. Fernandez, Don Fernandez, was lamenting how he had not had a vacation in, you know, six or seven years um, or something like that. So it's, it's a whole different operation. Gene, a lot of folks are discussing your choice of, you know, color versus black and white for the cranberry farm. Well, how did you feel when you're lining up those shots and seeing those fall colors in the back? Uh, it was, you know, it just, it's an amazing effect that you've got this colorful foreground, but it's just. Um, oh, it was, it was, it was, it was an amazing time to be there. And um, it, it made the whole experience just kind of fun. I mean, you know, who doesn't want to be um, among the fall colors, right? So it was great. It's beautiful. And it's, it's, I don't know if I'm going to convert them. Uh, maybe I should. I'm just not sure. I haven't had the, the heart to do it just yet. Even, even for the purpose of this presentation, I didn't have the heart to, to convert them to black and white. Yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, I, I feel like it's working. And also it feel, feels like we are kind of expecting color. Like when you're talking about cranberries, you're hoping to find some rich color there. And it's definitely... It's definitely there when we're yeah i toyed around with them i toyed around with them in black and white and they just weren't um conveying the um they weren't conveying the uh, just enormous beauty of that fall season so they are still in color uh fantastic so uh neely knows a farmer you should get in touch with so that's good um Let's see. Neely also asked, do you get more, do you ever get into their personal space? Uh, I do, I do get into their personal space, um, but I choose not to um, portray their personal space. Mm -hmm. my, pro my project is, is about them as, as far, <clears throat> excuse me, as farmers. And so I've made a conscious choice not to, um, not to be at the dinner table with them and not to make those photographs of them on Sunday or, you know, that kind of stuff with mm -hmm. one exception. And you can see the exception on my website there. Uh, one of the guys I photographed is an 86 year old uh, cattleman from Virginia, Reverend Lovely Moore. Um, and um, I was introduced to him by the guy who said he couldn't work with me, but Reverend Moore has 50 head of co cattle that he runs by himself at 86 or 87. And uh, he's also uh, a minister. He's been a minister forever. And so he's got a little church in Virginia. And uh, I, I wanted to, it was important for me to photograph uh, Reverend Moore on the farm and also in the church. And so I stayed over on a Sunday and, and I did that. I spent some time um, with him at his church, but that's the only exception. Uh, Kendra asks, do you have an end goal in mind? Are you gonna do a book? Are you gonna do a show? Yeah, the end goal is is a is a book, um, and people always want to know if I'm done or when I'll be done. And I I don't know. I I know I'm not done now, and I think I will be done when I feel like I have a really um, rich mix of like I said before, crop, um, age, gender, um, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm I'm just getting not even scratching the surface. I've only been to one um, woman run farm so far. Uh, and I had uh, a couple lined up for 2020, but, but that fell through. Um, there's an interesting woman um, in upstate New York who, who runs a farm called Soul Fire Farms. You can, she's on my website and, and you can go to her website and see what kind of stuff they do. But she's a, a pretty well-known activist and author and farmer. And um, her thing is unlike uh, the older generation, um, she does a, a, only about two acres, I think, but um, she sells uh, to specialty markets uh, in upstate New York and also um, those, um, they call them CSA farm baskets that go to, mm -hmm. um, to folks. Um, and then she also trains young people in farming techniques. So they, um, she and her, uh, her partners in upstate New York are doing a pretty interesting farm. So I spent a week with them. Oh, great. All right. So uh, let's see. Um, are you interested in in small farms? So Sam Walker, she knows a couple small farms. 
maybe uh, uh yeah 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 we can we can talk offline but uh, i'm definitely interested in small farms yeah so folks uh reach out to gene if you got ideas a couple questions about the organic cranberry harvester how does the organic machine get the cranberries off the plants it 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 uh if you can see my fingers the device kind of goes like that and just takes them off the vines and and throws them into the bag so it's a um continuous circular process where they come off the vine into the bag off the vine into the bag so that part's not done manually but for whatever reason they decided they need to get the bags out of the bog um, on somebody's back, so go figure. Yeah. So Gene, you've got some other, on your website, you've got a few other farmers on there. So folks want to see more in this series, they can go to your website. Yeah, I do. I decided to focus on just two farms um, so that I could try to be a little bit more comprehensive rather than, um, you know, here's six, you know, here's six from this farm and here's six from that farm. So, um, that was great. It was really, like I said, it really felt like a journey uh, and, you know, an immersive experience to go to these places and see what Yeah, it, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And I think it's an important um, bit of, of documentation. Um, black farmers now only have about 5% of the total um, farm acreage in the United States. Um, and they're only, what, I don't know, 40,000, give or take, black farmers in the United States down from over half a million um, in w really interesting stuff to, to, to look into. But in the um, heyday of Jim Crow in the 30s, there were over half a million black farmers. Uh -huh. And right now, um, there are less than about 50,000 black farmers. So go figure. There's, there's a really good documentary that, that or uh, studies that have been, that I, I came across uh, a couple weeks ago about that same statistic, how um, Jim Crow and, and Southern white farmers, you know, you know, banded together to just take the land. The yeah, land. yeah, yeah. And there's, there's uh, the USDA has been um, yeah. a prime, uh, a prime actor in some of that land, that black land loss. Um, there was a lawsuit, I think, settled in 1999, if memory serves called um, Pigford versus um, Glickman. Glickman was the then uh, USDA um, uh, director or chairman or whatever. But um, the uh, litigation documented over a decade of active discrimination against black farmers that resulted in land loss. And uh, the, the settlement was over a billion dollars, um, which sounds like a lot until you figure out uh, and you talk to some of these guys. And I talked to some that have that uh, received some of this settlement, and they said the money was great, but it, it, it in no way could allow them to recapture the land that they lost. Um, and so, you know, um, it, uh, I suppose it's a good way to start, but it, it uh, didn't didn't fix the problem of um, black land loss um, that was just actively promoted by by the federal government. So what, what happens, the USDA is the primary lender to farmers and the, the, timing, the timing and the amount of your farm loan is critical. So you need to get your money, your loan money before um, planting season. And planting season is a very short amount of time and you need a certain amount of money. And what the U, uh, USDA their lending agents would do was if I went, if I said my farm, my um, planting season starts on September 1st and I'm in their office in July, they would only give me my loan in November and I missed my planting window and they'd give me half of the money that I needed. And so you three, four, five years of that and you know, the farm's going to be in foreclosure. Well, Gene, thank you uh, so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, yeah. That was so wonderful. I would totally <laughs> like to see more. I, it's, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. Cool. Hopefully, you know, uh, we get a vaccine and I can get back on the road, man. That's <laughs> what I'm looking forward to doing. Uh, so don't forget, you're going to be seeing some of Gene's work in our um, Representation Rising 
outdoor show, which hopefully will be opening uh, in a week or two. Um, but thank you again, Gene, and thank you everyone for coming and attending. It's just great to be with you. Um, and we've got Jenny uh, on the 22nd, so don't forget to sign up for that. Uh, and until then, Wait, well, cheers, everybody. You thank know, you, you, know I always have, you know I always have something to say at the end. Gene, <laughs> you want to kind of plug your show? Gene has a show that he was a juror on. Coming. I forgot. Oh, yeah. What's that? What 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 did I do now, Richard? Your show. Do you want show. to talk about your show? The... On Solano. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. Uh, so welcome. what is today's September 1st? Um, I uh, I did a uh, cur curatorial uh, thing with a friend of mine, Becky Jaffe. Um, and we started thinking about all the art that was being made uh, when people began to shelter in place. And so... Um, we talked to Robbie Abrams, the owner of Abrams Claghorn Gallery, and talked him into um, letting us put together a show. Um, we put out a call for work, and the only um, requirement was that the work be made while we had been sheltering in place, so since March, basically. Um, and, you know, all of my friends are photographers, so I made it a point to invite people who weren't photographers. So we have uh, some... <laughs> some um, painting and some sculptural stuff and some mosaic stuff. And it's a really um, wonderful show. I have to kind of say that. So when we started on uh, yesterday more or two days ago in the morning, we had all these boxes and, you know, all this stuff strewn all over the gallery. And last night at four o'clock, we had all this beautiful stuff on the wall. And it was like, holy moly, we did this? You know, it's pretty amazing. Um, so I have to encourage you to go, uh, you can either make an appointment uh, to go over to Abrams Claghorn, um, but he's open from 10 to three, I think Tuesday through Saturday as well. Um, social distancing, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a wonderful show, some really, really beautiful work and some great artists. So check it out if you can. Thank you, Richard, I'd forgotten about that. Appreciate it. Welcome. <laughs> And eventually Vince will kill me for all these last minute insertions, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm a tough guy. So I'll, I'll it wouldn't take, be I'll the same it. without it. I'll take, I'll take it for the team. Oh, and thanks, Rose, for putting the link in the chat. Oh, yeah. Right on. All yes, right. Thank you, everyone. Great seeing everybody. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Vince and Anita, for doing this. It's amazing. Thank you.